current futurologist. Um, don't let that, don't let that uh, prejudice you. Um, my talk is called Eight Principles for Successful Optimists and uh, for Winning the Future. So, um, most famous quote in futurology, if you're a science fiction fan, you'll know this man. This is William Gibson. Uh, he wrote Neuromancer and a bunch of other stuff. Very prescient thinker. He said, the future is here, and it's all around us. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, by which I took to mean that we often see things on the scientific horizon, in laboratories and whatever, but it takes quite a while for them to uh, penetrate the general market or reach the general populace. Now, he said that in 1993. And this statement has become increasingly false um, since he said it, as this graphic demonstrates. So technologies uh, actually diffuse themselves into the general populace increasingly quickly, sort of in a hyper-exponential way. Uh, so to put it another way, uh, the future is coming faster than you think. Um, so we're moving into this new age, and um, some people call it the information age, but actually information is only really one part of it. I mean, yes, we are changing our relationship with information, but we're changing our relationship with far more fundamental things as well. Um, biology, matter, time, the very definition of actually what it means to be human. So while the changes that have been wrought by digital technology have occupied so many headlines and so much of our thoughts over the last 10 or 15 years, I have to tell you that the, the digital revolution was really just the cocktail sausage before dinner. Um, and that brings a whole bunch of challenges. Now, to understand where we're going, um, we need to know where we've come from. So, um, 15 billion years ago, the universe pops into existence with the Big Bang. Just for the geeks in the audience, I know that is a representation of the Big Bang, not the actual Big Bang. Sometimes get uh, picked up on that by people, single people. Um, so, 15 billion years, and then, uh, you know, after about 10 billion years, we get star clusters forming, and the early Earth, and uh, on the early Earth, we have the primordial oceans, and uh, in the primordial oceans, we have these, uh, these molecules uh, floating about, uh, the amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of every single protein that every single one of your cells makes. So they're the very building blocks of life. And slowly, over hundreds of millions of years, uh, somehow these uh, molecules arrange themselves into these small computing devices called cells. Uh, and these cells sort of read the DNA, which is itself an extraordinary molecule. This is a biologist's paper, really. It's able to store the code of life and then uh, and transmit it. In fact, we're now thinking about using DNA as a storage mechanism for digital data because it's actually much better than magnetic uh, means. Um, anyway, these uh, little computing machines, these cells, eventually start to organize themselves into what a biologist would call a simple multicellular organism, uh, like this algae here. And then several more hundred million years pass and they start becoming complex multicellular organisms. And then something quite extraordinary happens which is these, uh, these organisms start forming societies. So we've gone from sort of societies of cells to societies of creatures. This is actually a picture of some ants farming aphids, which I find quite extraordinary. Um, so, you know, social structures. This is where Facebook really starts, to be honest. Um, and then the organisms get very complicated until uh, we get things like this and things like that. I can guarantee you, if any of you are under the age of 12, you would have said, ah, at that point. <laughs> Uh, and then we get to this creature on the far right, the repetitively named Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, you and me. And inside this creature's head is a particular society of cells that looks like that, the brain. And this gives rise to a whole new kind of evolution, which is cultural evolution, the evolution of society through ideas and technology and trade. And like biological evolution, cultural evolution tends towards increasing complexity until you get things like Shakespeare and Shanghai and Shakira and shampoo and shovels and share trading. And here we all are. Now, most people tend to think that uh, this process is over. We forget that, actually, you know, that this is an ongoing process because we were quite arrogant as human beings. And we think, oh, that's great. We're, it's, that's all in the past. You know, it's not, it's not carrying on. And that's OK if you want to imagine that Mitt Romney is the pinnacle of God's plan. Uh, but clearly he isn't. And um, I want to show you. Um, a little bit of what comes next. Um, so, this is what's happening to the cost of genome sequencing. Um, about, uh, I think it was in 2001, the first complete human genome was done, and that cost $100 million. Uh, $100 million. And now we can do it for a thousand. 
So a total of 13 years later, you can do it for a thousand. Um, I did the maths on the trends on this, and that means that the uh, hundred dollar genome will be with us by 2015, the one dollar genome will be with us by 2018, and the one cent genome will be with us by 2021. It's actually outstripping Moore's law, the, uh, obviously the stratospheric uh, law that explains why my mobile phone has more processing power in it than the entire Apollo space mission. Um, it's outstripping that by a factor of four since the back end of 2008. And that has some pretty um, interesting consequences. Uh, for instance, it brings us to a place where we can start to uh, sequence the genomes from different cells from the same patient. In fact, I've already done this uh, at the... Uh, Sanger, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge. So they took two cells from a patient with lung cancer, one that had been affected by the cancer, one that was without the cancer, and they were able to compare them. So this will change your diagnosis in the future from I'm sorry to tell you you have cancer to you'll be pleased to know we have sequenced your cancer and we have a set of personalised drugs just for you. In fact, the very first drugs targeted at particular genetics for cancer have just been approved in America. Um, so we have a pensions crisis at the moment. So you know, um, and <laughs> it's because we're all living too long. Uh, so uh, as as pension providers look at an audience of about your age, they they simply get terrified uh, because you're probably expected to live far too long. I'm afraid to tell you, uh, when they invented the pensions uh, uh, system, uh, you were expected to retire at about 65. And you were pretty much expected to check out by the time you were 67. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not happening. So um, we have this pension crisis, and with these new technologies, and also um, stem cell technologies, where people are, are right now walking around the planet with entirely uh, grown replacement body organs grown from their own stem cells. That's not science fiction. There are a number of patients already doing that. With these sorts of technologies, and with what's happening in medicine, we're tending to live a lot longer, and that's going to change a lot of our, our, our institutions. I mean, you know, if we all start living to 100 or 120 or 130, what does that do to work, or retirement, or relationships? Uh, I was speaking to my mum about this the other day, and she said, I love your father, but 60 years is a fucking long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what about living forever? What about living forever? Well, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Until you realise that there are immortal creatures that already live on the planet. I'll show you one. This is Tetrahymena. Tetrahymena is a freshwater bug, um, and it's biologically immortal. It's not completely immortal, you can still run over it with a bus. But if it gets to eat, it never ages. And it's not the only immortal creatures, there's actually a few that live on this planet. Um, now, it does this by controlling a particular enzyme in its cells called telomerase. Now, you all have telomerase in every single one of your cells, but your levels of it decline as uh, you get older. Well, mine as well. I'm not saying I'm different. We all have the same cells. No. But your, our levels of telomerase decline as we get older, and that's one of the reasons that we age and die. Now, because we are now able to read the genetics of this creature and start to sort of look into biology in, 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 a, in a much more granular way, we've been able to uncover how it does what it does. And using that technology, we've been able to reverse aging in some human cell lines. So think about that. Every time I say it to an audience of over 40, they go, is there a skincare product based on it? <laughs> um, so just as we're learning to read genetic data, we're also learning to write it, okay? So biology is becoming programmable. And we, sh you know, many people are glad that it, that it is. Um, in an audience this size, there will almost certainly be somebody who's diabetic. And uh, they may well know that their insulin that they inject comes from a bacteria. And this is one of the first applications of synthetic biology, programmable biology, back in 1976, where uh, um, some scientists worked out that you could change the genome of an E. coli bacteria such that if it ate uh, sugar, it would excrete insulin. Which is pretty good, uh, because before uh, we had this technique, uh, we used to get insulin from pigs. Um, and sometimes that caused an allergic reaction uh, in the patient. And to be honest, the pigs weren't all that keen on the arrangement either. So um, if you can get a bacteria to, uh, to uh, eat sugar and excrete insulin, can you get to do other things? Of course you can. For instance, you can get to eat carbon dioxide and excrete crude oil. Uh, these technologies already exist. Uh, there's other research. So this is a potential one-stop shop for the climate crisis and the energy crisis, when you think about it. Um, we also have uh, other ways to remove 
our dependence on fossil fuels. A uh, research came out in September last year where bacteria had been altered to eat uh, CO2 and water and excrete most of our favourite plastics. Again, most of those are currently derived from oil. So I'd say this isn't science fiction. This program biology is already sort of at that stage where I guess you know, computing was about 1965 and it's moving at the same speed. Um, so one of my advisory roles is something called the Virgin Earth Challenge. And the Virgin Earth Challenge is a $25 million prize put up by Richard Branson for any organisation that can commercially uh, and environmentally sustainably remove carbon dioxide from the air. So one of the, one of the weapons we can use against climate change. Um, we had uh, 2,600 applications for the prize. Um, a lot of them from nutters, it has to be said. Um, but uh, so a lot of them had, so a good number of them had some serious merit, and we put those through a very rigorous technical and scientific analysis. Uh, we got down to a, sort of, uh, a short list of about 100, where they went through even more analysis, and they went by the wayside. And in September last year, we announced 11 finalists. So these are 11 companies that all have the potential quite soon to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in a commercially sustainable way at a gigaton level. Um, and of course now some of these finalists are already talking to uh, biofuels companies or bacterial fuels companies to think well what should we do with the carbon dioxide? Let's not bury it, let's make use of it. In fact let's put it through some algae or bacteria and create the carbon neutral oil refinery. This technology, this is obviously a mock-up, but this actual technology already exists. It's just a matter now of scaling it and getting it uh, cheaper. Um, and one of, another one of my roles is I sit on the Future Fools and Transport Committee at the Institu Institution of Mechanical Engineers. And in talking to some people on that committee, um, we've concluded that we don't really think this is actually that far off in terms of being actually sustainable commercially. The shortage will not be the technology, the shortage will be the number of engineers who understand how this stuff works. Uh, that would be a problem in Europe, perhaps, but not so much in China. So just think about the implications of this for, for the world. Um, we don't have things like this, for instance. Uh, no more deep water horizons. Uh, men like this don't take us into situations like that, uh, which um, saves quite a lot of money, actually. Estimated cost of Iraq war to you and me as UK taxpayers. This is a figure from our own treasury. Uh, and that because it's a figure from our own treasury, it's almost certainly understated. Um, how about the cost of the American economy? Well, I went to the um, a Nobel Prize winning um, economist, Joseph Stiglitz, and he came up with that figure. Um, just think for a moment, just 10% of that money had been spent researching bacterial fuels. I mean, there wouldn't, probably wouldn't have been a war with them, which has some other interesting implications. Now, that's all well and good, but there's actually something much bigger than that going on, which is, um, just as with the computing revolution, the digital revolution, um, program biology, it doesn't just change what we can do, it changes who can do it. So this biology is going to become programmable by you and me. In fact, there's already organizations like BioCurious and DIY Bio who are hacking biology in garages. Um, uh, BioCurious's uh, mission statement says that innovations in biology should be accessible, affordable, and open to everyone. So the people who are hanging out in these places are the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs of the biotech revolution. And uh, when you think about that, that means that maybe in 20 or 30 years, why not have your own petrol source in your own garage made from bacteria, the design of which you download it from the internet and hack it yourself? Or why not start worrying about the bioterrorist in the next door shed? Because they're both equally likely scenarios. Okay. Um, so biology is becoming programmable. This is huge. Uh, it's not just biology that's being on program as well, so it's matter. So um, some of you are probably very aware that uh, manufacturing is about to be assaulted by a 3D printing revolution. Uh, and some of you probably know about this company, MakerBot. MakerBot, I think, could be the apple of desktop manufacturing. Um, remember when, uh, well, actually you're too young, I remember 
when about 30 years ago, uh, Apple invented a computer with a few fonts on it and a bit of color, and everybody started making rubbish newsletters. Uh, this could be that moment, okay? This is about, this is under $2,000, and you can start to print things in plastic on a desktop that, that look a bit rubbish. Um, now, um, what was I going to say? Yes, now, think about this for a moment. Uh, HMV went bust last week, okay? Why? Well, we all know why. They went bust because of digital revolution. Now, if I was a toy manufacturer, I might look at that HMV moment, look at this technology, and then go and look at my business model again. Uh, because these were all printed on the MakerBot. Uh, in fact, all those were printed on the MakerBot as well. I mean, think about it, as a kid, why am I going to spend 40 pounds on a piece of plastic that's the same as everybody else's piece of plastic, um, and when I can probably co-evolve toys with my friends, hack toys with my friends, download the design now, print it out this afternoon, and have it for half the price. Um, in fact, people are already doing that, so if, you know, some of you may be aware of this. This is Thingiverse, which is an online database of 3D printable objects. Um, and uh, this, that is a massive copyright infringement on the front page. Uh, but what are you going to do about it? Um, the, internet, the story of the music industry is very instructive here. Um, what it, what, so it's not just plastic you can print. Um, if you want, um, if you want uh, electricity in your toy, which you probably will, uh, you, you can print a, um, a conductive polymer. So that man's just printed a games controller. Um, you can also print in metal. So the American talk show host, um, Jay Leno, is a massive vintage car fan. And if you're a vintage car fan, you'll know that it's actually quite hard to get the parts, because obviously they're old, and when you do get hold of them, often they're, often they're a little bit dodgy. So what uh, Jay's garage does is they find those parts, they scan them in 3D, tidy them up, and then uh, if you want, say, I don't know, a camshaft for your 57 Chevy, you go there, you order it, they download it, and they print it in metal for you the next day. I was talking to a car manufacturer about this last week, and they cracked themselves. Because um, pretty soon you're going to have people building their own cars and their garages with 3D printers. Um, the open source car project is not very far away. Uh, even James Bond, who's at the uh, forefront of many of our technology imaginings, has a, has a 3D printed car. Um, you've seen Skyfall? Yeah, there's a slight distressing moment where the DB5 gets totaled by all those rockets. I'm not even into cars, and even I was upset about that. And, uh, but that wasn't the actual car. It was a, a, a completely printed 3D replica made by a company in Germany. Uh, some people are thinking even bigger. The Open Source Ecology Project has what they call the Global Village Construction Center. I'm just going to read you uh, the definition of the Global Village Construction Center. It is a modular DIY, low-cost, high-performance platform that allows for the easy fabrication of 50 different industrial machines that it takes to build a small, sustainable civilization with modern comforts. <laughs> and probably quite cheaply. So the orange line represents the cost using traditional manufacturing techniques. This is what Open Source Ecology Project reckons those machines will cost using these new manufacturing techniques. Um, uh, it's, again, this stuff isn't science fiction. Another one of my advisory roles is to something called Space Gambit, and Gambit stand, stands for the Global Alliance of Makers Building Interstellar Technology. And those are people in hacker spaces and maker spaces creating uh, stuff that will go into space, and they're funded by the US Department of Defense. How far can this go? I mean, you might want to think about a world where your mobile phone never runs out of power because it has an incredibly efficient uh, solar panel on it. Uh, where that phone can give you a blood test, where you can download the design of a drug from the internet based on what that blood test has told you, and then print the drug you need at home. And even that's not science fiction, I'm afraid, because we can already power our phones uh, with solar power. This is a blood test you can attach to an iPhone. Um, this is one for diabetes, but there's about 20 or 30 of these now, and they're combining themselves. And this man has just designed a printer that prints pharmaceuticals. This is Lee Cronin at Glasgow University. I mentioned that to a pharmaceutical company last week, and they cracked themselves. The point that I want to make here is that these technologies are not, as I say, not just changing who can make and do, so what we can make and do, but who can make and do them. A radical democratization of power, which fundamentally changes the way civilization works. Brings the huge opportunities, also brings the huge risks. So yes, 3D printing, very useful for printing toys, actually quite useful for printing guns as well. 
So a uh, chem printer that can print drugs, very good for delivering drugs perhaps to people who need them in remote locations, pretty good for gangs to print narcotics with as well. So with this massive revolution coming, the end of industrialism, essentially, that you're going to live through and you're going to help shape. As we move into this new age that we don't have a name for yet, everything is up for grabs. We have a huge opportunity to do something amazing. We can solve the energy conversion crisis. We can deal with poverty. We can deal with climate change if we know how to use these technologies. At the same time, we could easily destroy ourselves. And so a lot of my work is trying to help organisations think about these big changes and be, behave more ethically, more responsibly, more humanely. And, um, but in the face of the world, it's often quite hard to know what to do and how to succeed. I mean, there are some people, we all know them, who consistently manage to do good shit. Like, whatever happens, whatever the world throws at them, they still manage to do good stuff all the time. And how do they do it? And I, I'm lucky enough to work with quite a lot of them. As the philosopher uh, Mark Bedeau says, that change is going to come. You can try to ignore it, uh, which is irresponsible. You can try and stop it, which is impossible. Or you can try and change things in a positive direction. Which essentially means that there is the only one game in town, which is trying to make the world better. So how do we go about that? Well, um, I'm going to go to the military first, actually. Um, this is Field Marshal Helmut Karl Bernhard Graf von Moltke, and he is regularly cited as one of the um, 19th century's greatest military strategists. And as far as I can work out, he was the first person to say, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And so what he came up with is this idea of commander's intent, which is that we'll have a plan going into battle, but we know that things could go horribly wrong at some point. So I give you, my troops, the authority to improvise, but always keep an eye on what I want you to do, my intent, which is take that hill or cut that supply line. So have the intent in mind, but be able to improvise around it. And what I realised was that most of the people I know who get good things done have commander's intent, but they, they don't call it that. They say, these are my principles, these are my values. That's the commander's intent you need. Not rules and regulations, but values and principles. And I'm going to share those values with you now. So the first one is really simple, which is have an unashamed optimism of ambition about the future. We live in a very cynical age where actually saying the world could be better, that things could be better than they are, that you want to do something about that, um, is easy to knock down. People will tell you that your dreams are trivial. Uh, but your dreams are not trivial, they're profound. You know, Martin Luther King did not stand on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and say, I have a plan. <laughs> so don't be afraid to dream something extraordinary. If you're not prepared to dream something extraordinary, you will never do anything extraordinary. Second principle is that all these people engage in a project that is bigger than they are. Now, um, this is related to, and it's related very much to this theme about happiness. This is Daniel Dennett. He's um, a philosopher and uh, also a great uh, impersonator of, uh, of Father Christmas. Um, he says that one of the occupational hazards of being a philosopher is you get asked difficult questions at parties. I mean, you know, most of us know what it's like. You go to a party and you say, well, I'm a plumber. And say, oh, well, I've got this view bend. Or if you're a doctor, you say, oh, I've got a dodgy knee. Can you? If you're a philosopher, it's like, what's consciousness? <laughs> Just was having a beer, really. Thanks for that. He says, uh, one of the questions to get asked a lot as a philosopher is, what's happiness? What's the definition of happiness? And he says, the best definition he's come up with is find something more important than you are and dedicate your life to it. Now, I can't think of a better definition. All the people I know have that. People who have a project that's bigger than them are generally nice, happy people to hang around with. Not sort of just jerky and jolly, but they have a happiness deep in the core. And people who have a project that's only the same size as themselves, bigger car, bigger house, TV, bigger than God, you know, are usually pretty dull. In fact, most of us who've been through that get to the point where you kind of go, is this it? And I feel pretty unhappy despite having everything. So, find something more important than you are, and dedicate your life to it. Third one is what you're doing now. Engineering serendipity. 
Um, find ways to come into contact with as many different ideas as you can. Too, much, too many people stuck in the Industrial Revolution go to the same office every day and meet the same eight people and the same eight ideas every year, and then they wonder why nothing changes. Okay? Uh, all the successful optimists I know are always out there smashing themselves with new ideas, disagreeing with people in a productive fashion. Um, uh, and, and at MIT, um, for instance, they, they create buildings where people will bump into each other deliberately. Um, I think it's great. Um, Matt Ridley says that innovation occurs when ideas have sex. So you need to make sure that uh, your ideas are promiscuous. Let your ideas get very slutty, essentially, and get out there and uh, you know, help them sleep with people that they wouldn't normally sleep with. Um, so it's yeah, sort of summarised by that slide there. Um, this is what I really like. Um, you are what you do, not what you intend to do. And most of us tend to think we're somebody else. Uh, we tend to think that we're not really that obstreperous, difficult, uh, miserable person uh, that we're being. It's just that this week it's quite difficult, or I had a difficult childhood, or there's not the budget, or my boss is a Nazi. Um, but actually, if you are being obstreperous and difficult, then you are that person. It's quite simple. Um, you know, you, you, successful optimists just get on and do stuff, rather than complaining about what they can't do, which is why they're always so, so busy. Um, and I want to uh, demonstrate this point with one of my favourite stories about this now. This is Werner Forsman. Werner Forsman has almost certainly saved the life of somebody you know. Uh, he invented the technique of cardiac catheterization, which is a technique of getting um, a tube into your heart um, for opening up a valve or delivering some drugs or getting a camera in there if they need to have a look around. Now, um, Werner came up with this idea back in about 1929, I think, and back then the accepted wisdom was that you couldn't touch the human heart without killing the patient. That was the accepted medical wisdom. And Werner had seen uh, vets touch animals' hearts and thought, mm, no, I, think, I don't think that's true. And he came up with this idea of cardiac catheterization. And he went to his bosses uh, with this idea and said, can I try it out on one of our heart patients? And they went, no, you're mad, you'll kill them, go home. He said, oh, come on, <laughs> give me one that's going to die anyway. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? I'll just kill him a bit earlier. Um, I have to say, I'm paraphrasing Werner at this point. He didn't actually speak like that. Um, and they said, no, no, we're not, <laughs> it's not going to work. You know, families get up, upset about that kind of stuff, Werner, go home. He says, uh, all right, look, I'll do it on myself. How about that? And uh, his bosses went, the ethics committee will go nuts. No, you can't do that, go home. So what did Werner do? Well, I think he did the only sensible thing that a physician in his position could do, which is he decided to seduce the chief nurse. <laughs> he did this uh, because Gerda Ditson, the chief nurse, had the keys to the cupboard with all the surgical equipment he would need to do that on himself. He was going to do it anyway. And so uh, in his autobiography, Werner says, I started to prowl around Gerda like a sweet-toothed cat around a cream jug. <laughs> This is Germans aren't romantic. Uh, so, um, but actually, of course, they got on very well. I mean, she was the chief nurse. She was fascinated by surgery and medicine, of course. So, um, after they sort of, you know, developed this friendship, after a few weeks, he sort of told her his big idea. And Gerda said, not only will I give you the keys to the cupboard, but I'll be your first patient. It'll be much easier if you have something to do it on rather than doing it on yourself. So do it on me. Incredible woman. So they wander into the hospital well, late, uh, one night, a few, a few nights later, and, uh, they, uh, they, and, and, and Gerda is strapped down to an operating table and Werner is making a, uh, tapping her arm with some iodine um, in preparation for a, uh, an insertion. And then he leaves her there, tied up. And he goes into the next room and starts performing the procedure on himself because he doesn't want to hurt her. He doesn't want to risk her. Uh, now, I don't know if you've ever tried self-cardiac catheterization. <laughs> Uh, it's not easy, uh, especially if you're the first person in history ever to try it. And he can't get the thing all the way into his heart. Uh, so he wanders back into the room where Gerda is tied up and says, you have to help me. And she's a little bit upset with him, as we said. Uh, but anyway, he unties her, and, and sure enough, she helped push the tube into his heart. They think, I think he's there. Let's get down to the x-ray room, take an x-ray of this. If we can take the x-ray, we can prove it, and you know, we've made our point. They get down to the x-ray room where they are confronted by another one of their colleagues, Peter Romeos, who is horrified 
by what he sees, and immediately tries to pull the tube out of Werner's arm, which is quite painful, as you can imagine. Werner does the only thing I think a reasonable physician can do in this situation, which is he decides to kick Peter really hard in the testicles several times. Um, and <laughs> as you would, uh, he, poor Peter, hobbles off uh, looking for reinforcements. Uh, in the meantime, Gerda and Werner left alone in the x-ray room, take the x-ray, and here it is. This is the actual x-ray they took. And you can just see the line of the catheter going all the way into Werner's heart. So Werner Forsman won a Nobel Prize for that. A Nobel Prize. A Nobel Prize won by breaking every single one of the rules, seducing a colleague, and kicking another colleague in the testicles. <laughs> The point is that you are what you do. And every time I find myself procrastinating, I tend to think of Werner and then just get on with it. The fifth principle, this one a lot of us talked about but nobody really says, is that making this, no, nobody really does, is that making mistakes is okay but not trying is irresponsible, okay? So many of us are actually terrified of the mistake we're going to make. We don't do anything at all. But a successful optimist knows that making a mistake is not only Inevitable, it's kind of essential if you're going to do anything creative. I um, mean, that famous TED talk by Ken Robertson where he says, Making mistakes is not the same as being creative, but if you're not prepared to be creative, sorry, if you're not prepared to make mistakes, you will never do anything original. Um, you know, even Keith Richards understands this. Uh, he was asked how he came up with all those amazing riffs for the Stone songs, and he said, I just start playing until I make the right mistake. I think that's really profound, actually. He's saying, I'm, I'm I'm convinced I'll make something beautiful out of getting something wrong. As creative people, you probably know this a lot, but even still, you keep coming against clients who are really a little bit worried about you making mistakes. Um, now, the reason I think this one is important about making mistakes is giving yourself permission to make mistakes is actually quite hard, given that we grew up in an age of industrialism that tells us that mistakes are bad. Um, but giving the people who work for you permission to make mistakes is even harder. Because I want to ask you what you would have done if you were Werner Forsman's boss. Because most of us would have done what his boss has done and told him to stop. The next principle is you must always ask for evidence. Okay? If you want to get things done, you have to commit to evidence, rational thinking, scientific uh, method. Because um, that will get you past your beliefs, your ideology, and accepted wisdom. The evidence doesn't really care much for your opinion. Um, think about it, okay? Engineers do not build bridges from a left wing or a right wing perspective, do they? They build bridges from an engineering, evidence-based perspective, and over time, bridges get better. Whereas politicians do things from a left wing or a right wing perspective, and you've probably noticed that over time, our politics gets worse. Now, I'm not saying ignore politics, that would be naive. But you'll get much more done if you think like an engineer and less like a politician. This is demonstrated, I think, by a great, a great story. The truth of which is debated, but I hope it's true. It's about Michael Faraday, and he was demonstrating the Faraday coil to the then Chancellor of the Exchequer. And uh, the Chancellor said, Mr. Faraday, this electricity is all very interesting, but what is it for? And Faraday apparently said, I don't know, Minister, but when we find out, you will tax it. <laughs> The next principle is, I think, really powerful and uh, certainly helped me a lot, which is this one. Is it successful optimists lose? They lose most of the time, in fact. Um, and here's how it works. What they tend to do is think of these bigger than me projects as a lo very long game. And let's say it's a game with 10 rounds. So in round one, you've got 10 people, you know, 100% of the world to convince. Um, and um, you'll lose, and <laughs> you'll lose nine times out of ten. Nine times out of ten, people will tell you you're an idiot, and you'll probably win one out of the ten. Okay. Round two, pretty much the same thing's happened. You've got nine battles left, you're going to lose eight of them. So, you know, you've got two people with you now. Round three, okay. Now, um, the problem with most of us is that we confuse round one for the whole game. So you've got your brand new idea, 
You go into the boardroom or wherever it is to try and convince you know, 10 people, and nine of them tell you you're an idiot. You go to 10 investors, nine of them won't you know, just say, get out, of my, get out of my room. You know? And so you think, I'm clearly wrong. I'm clearly, I'm clearly, I'm clearly got this you know, completely off kilter. And we stop. Some people might get past around one, get around two, but you know, eight out of 10 people are still telling me I'm an idiot. Um, so you stop. The thing is, you don't start winning until around six. And success optimists know that at the beginning, you're going to lose most of the time. There's a great quote, which is, uh, don't be worried about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats. <laughs> so what eventually happens, of course, is you get to, you get to uh, round nine, and you know, this is the result. This is, this is fairly standard. Um, the other great thing about this is it's an incredibly good metric to tell you where you are in the game. So if I go home to my girlfriend, and I've had you know, 10 meetings with investors, and seven of them you know, trying to help these investors be more ethical or responsible, and seven of them are told to get lost. You know, I'm having a pretty bad day, but then my girlfriend reminds me that, well, you're in round three. So now I know where I am, and that helps to keep you going. This is the final principle. Just please your own cynicism. So cynicism is culturally normal now. Um, it's embedded in our society. You know, it's very easy to knock people down, you know. I find myself being cynical every day, you know. I mean, you know, particularly if you're English, you know, you, you basically come out of the birth canal and they go, oh, it's rubbish here. <laughs> Have a copy of the Daily Mail. Uh, that'll tell you how rubbish it is for the rest of your life. Uh, so, you know, you know, I, you know we're, we're bred into it. I find myself thinking, oh, who, do I, who am I to try and change the world? Who, that person over there, it's a ridiculous idea. You know, I'm one in a nine sometimes. You know, it's really hard because, it's, because cynicism is so easy, isn't it? It's, it's so easy to do because it means that you can be lazy. And cynicism is both a recipe and an excuse for laziness because for the cynic, a better world, a better way of doing things is too hard to imagine. And if it's too hard to imagine, it's too hard to do anything about. So it's incredibly, incredibly comfortable. I like to say that cynicism is a bit like smoking. Uh, you may think it looks cool, but it's actually very bad for you and it's bad for the people standing next to you as well. Uh, and I got so obsessed with cynicism and, and how it's become culturally embedded that I did some work with um, the neuroimaging department down at University College London to work out what happens in the brain when we're having a, a cynical thought. And we came up with a schematic that sort of demonstrates what happens in the minds of two people in a cynical situation. It goes like this. <laughs> So those are the eight principles. <laughs> um, and those, those eight principles together, I think, create a really great commander's intent for our future collectively and for your own future personally. Um, but if you wanted to sort of summarise it in one thing, and I think this is probably appropriate for this audience, is you know, we have to let go of industrialism and stop being defined by what we own and start being defined by what we create. So I'm going to finish uh, up now with a, a, another story, a quick story. Um, a futurologist, as I am, I often get asked to predict things. And a journalist recently said to me, what will the world look like in 50 years, Mark? And I said, actually, I don't make predictions. If you look at the history of the futurology, you'll find out that the predictions that were made will tell you far more about the particular prejudice or wish list of the futurologist that was asked than what actually happened. We're very, very bad at predicting things. Uh, here's a few of my favorite examples. Man will not fly for 50 years by the man who invented the aeroplane. Uh, who the hell wants to hear actors talk by one of the men who said Warner Brothers. I mean, you'd think he really have had a handle on this. And of course, the classic, I think there'll probably be a world life for five computers by the man who ran IBM. So if these people can't predict you know, the future uh, in their own markets, we're very, very, very bad. But what I did say was, look, the future we have will be defined by the values that we choose. And it, we may just be at that point with these new programmable technologies where those values can be defined not by constraint as they have so much in the past, but by what we're prepared to dream. And so we have to ask ourselves, all of us in this room, what kind of world do we want? What kind of world do we dream? And then how are we going to live those values? How are we going to make them happen? But if the dreams you have are not, of, are not dreams of sustainability and compassion, and humanity and justice, then we'd all better be prepared for the consequences. 
Now, I'm not saying the world will be better. I'm saying it could be. And everybody in this room should be in that game. The good news is, of course, is that the future, for the first time in a long time, is actually up for grabs. And you're the generation that's going to change it. And the other piece of good news is that you don't need anybody's permission to be brilliant. Thank you for listening.